Big Jimmy! Yeah! 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 For God's sake, burn it down. That was Kevin Rowland, and I'm Alexis Sale. I'm here to present the story of the most unique band that Britain's produced in the last 25 years, Dexy's Midnight Runners. Over the next hour, you're going to hear about a band who put their hearts on the line with every record they made and every concert they performed. Often they were abused by people, which led to breakups and breakdowns. A couple of times in their career, they were actually celebrated by people, but that didn't suit them much either. We've got talk of stolen tapes, stylized vocals, horns and fiddles, dressing up and dressing down. And there'll be some of the most powerful music that was ever made in Britain. From a youth of waste, a life of mess. It's a prize to be able to express myself. Like fuss. My name is Kevin Rowland. I'm the leader of the band. First musical memories, I suppose, would be singing songs, you know, uh, when we lived in Ireland, where I was living from the age of one to four, having been born in Wolverhampton. And I can remember like singing songs, you know, like I'm a rambler, I'm a gambler, I'm a long way from home, those kind of songs. And I remember like singing songs at primary school. It just seemed like an easy thing to do, a very pleasant thing to do. I loved doing it, and people seemed to like it. It was very simple then. Kind of got a bit complicated later. I was very interested in clothes and fashion, had always been, and I loved Roxy music in the early 70s. So I decided to form a band, you know. It started off as Lucy and the Lovers and sort of morphed into the... The Killjoys, as punk was kind of simultaneously happening, and that's how I got started, really. The first record Kevin made was with The Killjoys, a single featuring the songs Naive and Johnny Won't Get to Heaven. My brother Pete thought the title, Johnny Won't Get to Heaven. I'd already written the song, I think it could be me. It could be me, that was it, wasn't it? I suppose there's some jealousy there, maybe. Kevin quickly realised a lack of long-term prospects in punk. All that punk stuff, it, it wasn't like I imagined it was going to be. It was like I was always dirty, scruffy, carrying the equipment into a gig. The time you went on stage, you'd feel pretty lousy, and it wasn't what I wanted it to be like. Then I think the idea came to me, I think probably early 78. People are going to want soul. People are going to dance again. Kevin found a partner with the same first name as him. Roderick. No, Kevin Archer, who'd played guitar in the Killjoys. We put the advert in the paper. I think we described it as a new wave soul band. Birmingham Evening Mail. Keyboards, drums, bass, sax, trumpet, trombone. We advertised again for a whole band, you know. And we got quite a good response from it. We had trouble getting a trombone player. We can get one locally, so we put an advert in the Melody Maker, and Jim Patterson answered. It said, uh, trumpet and trombone player wanted for new wave soul group, and I, I didn't have a clue what that meant, really, to be honest. He phoned up from Scotland, and he came down the next day. Travelled overnight from Aberdeen. He's north of Aberdeen, Port Soy. It's a little village on the northeast coast of Scotland. It's near Banff. I arrived in um, the little garage where they were practising, and when they started playing, it was just so powerful and passionate. I'd read something, I think it was in the Melody Maker, it was like how to be a, a rock star or something, and it said, you need to practise eight hours every day. And they said, if your drummer doesn't want to practise eight hours every day, forget him, he's the wrong guy. And I just thought, this is so true. So I said to the band, we're going to all pack in our jobs, on the dole, practise every day. And that's all we did. So that was the strict work ethic. And it was coupled with a fierce antipathy to more complacent rock musicians. There was a music scene in Birmingham, a place called Mosley, where there was lots of bands and they were all quite laid back and they knew each other and they were friendly to each other. We also decided to adopt a bit of a siege mentality. I don't know why we did that. We didn't have any friends in other bands or any of that stuff. I think I thought that was too comfortable. This was a mission, you see. Yeah, it was dedication. And I think that paid off because we became tight. Jim and Jeff were really good on those brass arrangements. They go, let's just put this bit here. And they were just, yeah, that sounds good. Bernard Rhodes, one of Dexy's managers, obviously recognised that they were a band apart and he encouraged them to play up to their image. He said, look, you know, be a gang. 
and he said, and talking in interviews about being a gang, and he said about other gangs, and, and I thought, oh, well, that's a great idea. There was a fair bit of truth in it. We were manufactured, but we were self-manufactured, you know. And we did sit around in cafes a lot drinking tea. I still do. <laughs> And that's how the early Dexies are often remembered. With mug of tea in hand, the team that met in a calf. Booze was an issue too, but that was off the menu. Banned, in fact, by Kevin. Cheers, Kev, great. We decided to adopt that ethic and, and the others went along with it, with varying degrees of compliance. I mean, I, I was the exception to the rule. I'd have found it hard to be like that. But most of them, Kevin certainly, uh, stuck to the rules. We was building up a buzz. We'd already built up a buzz in Birmingham, you know, because we're doing, like, residences on a Friday night at a place called Uncle Sam's in Needless Alley, and people were coming, you know. Those people were coming. And it was good. We looked wild. Basically what became known later as new romantics, sort of pantaloons and things like that, and wild haircuts. But they never got to launch that look on the world. And that was due to a connection with the biggest young band in the Midlands. Too much, too young. The specials started to take off in summer of 79 while we were still unsigned. They got us a gig supporting them up in Manchester and I was wearing like a pink satin thing. I think we had a big tail and I used to have my hair all greased and quiffed and, you know, all kinds of makeup and stuff. Some of the audience possibly made the misassumption that because we were wearing clothes that they considered effeminate, that we were fair gay, but, you know, we fought back. Then they asked us to go on their tour. We decided, OK, and it's sort of panic measures, and we thought, well, we can't go. We knew we couldn't wear those clothes. We'd have been lynched by their audience. So we came up with that New York docker look, which I'd got from seeing Jim walk into the rehearsal studio one day. It was freezing cold, and I used to wear a, a woolly hat just to keep my head warm. It wasn't an image thing. It was just, uh, I don't like having a cold head, basically. I thought, well, that's a good look. You know, it was that. I'd always thought those New York dockers looked great, actually. With the music rehearsed and the look in place, Dexy set off gigging around the British Isles. Greg and Charlie Reed were 17-year-old kids at the time, though they'd later become the proclaimers. First time we ever came across the music of Dexys was um, at a gig at St Andrews University Students' Union in, I think, January or February of 1980. I knew they were from the Midlands, and we kind of thought it must be a ska thing. <laughs> and so we... We got the bus or hitched across to St Andrews, 18 miles from Mokhtar Mokhti. Dexys came on and I've never been as kind of shocked by anything I've seen this day. just the appearance and then the start up and it was the noise he made was, was incredible. They confronted people's expectations about what a band should be like and what kind of games we're going to play, because he just didn't seem to play any of the other games that he'd seen entertainers play before. The way that they confounded the expectations really is something that will stay with me forever. Meanwhile, at the other end of Britain, Paolo Hewitt was a young music journalist. I first saw him at uh, what was then called the Music Machine in Camden. I know it's cliche, we didn't knock you off your feet. Paolo convinced his bosses to let him write a feature on Dexys. I saw him at Shrewsbury and then I had to get up the next day and get on a train with them. I introduced myself, hi, I'm, I'm Paolo, I'm from Melody Maker, I'm going to be doing an interview. And they kind of just like nod at me, no one talks to me, so I thought, oh, sod it. We pull into wherever it was, we're walking on the platform and they suddenly start going to me, keep walking, keep walking, keep walking. And I'm going, no, 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 the, the exit's over here. They go, keep walking, keep walking, because I don't realise that I haven't got any tickets and that they're going to bunk it, you see. So next thing I know, they just all jump over the fence. And of course, I'm left standing there. And in the piece, I started off describing how I got off the train and they'd done the bunk. And then about three weeks later, this ad appeared in Melody Maker and then me, which said that they weren't going to be talking to the hippie music press anymore, that uh, we were all liars and that we'd all um, misrepresented them. So I rushed up to EMI and I said to him, what didn't you like about my piece? And he said to me, that stuff about bunking the trains, you made us look like villains. I then went home, turned on the TV, and they said, this is the new video for Dexys Midnight Runners. And it started off with them getting on a train and bunking it. As well as fair dodging and Jano baiting, by now Dexys had made it into the studio to cut their first single, Dance Dance, on AMI via Oddball Productions. But Kevin wasn't happy with it. 
We got the vibe down. It was just in the mix. My voice was swamped in echo, as was the brass. It just didn't represent us, that's all. It got to number 40, but we didn't think that was all right. The specials were like getting number threes and number twos. Well, why shouldn't we? Misgivings aside, it was an impassioned song. Kevin was drawing on painful memories. I was working in a shop in Birmingham in 74. Listen, it was terrible what had happened there. And not, you know, it was awful, those pub bombings. There was scares all the time and we'd all have to go outside the Birmingham shopping centre, you know, which was just near where it happened. And somebody coming up to a copper going, oh, I just saw uh, somebody uh, looked a bit suspicious over there. I think he was a duck egg. That's what they used to call Irish duck eggs, you know, because why duck eggs? Because the duck eggs were thick, thicker than the other ones, you know. And one day I just thought, well, if they're so stupid. The pride that Kevin has in his own family in the country that he's from has come through and it was the Irish jokes you need to get in the 70s and it was a negative thing and now Irish, right across the British Isles, very much a positive thing. Listing Irish authors was pivotal, as Craig said, in answering stupidity about Ireland. Kevin looked back into his past again for the lyrical inspiration for the next single. Back in 68, in a sweaty club, before Jimmy's machine and the rocksteady rub. The Railway Hotel in Wheelstone, in Harrow, in 68 with my brother. With all the kids at school, you still have, like, in the late 60s, these, like, document cases instead of briefcases or duffel bags. And they had in great big letters G-E-N-O. But you would never hear Gino. You know, you know, his records weren't in the charts, they weren't on the radio, he wasn't on top of the pops. You know, I saw that he was playing at the railway hotel, really desperate to go. We had a hot, live, hardcore soul show. <laughs> People would go crazy. We worked on the audience, keeping them entertained, shouting, screaming, dancing, jumping. <laughs> so I guess Kevin came one of those nights and uh, felt inspired. You know, I just wanted to be part of that whole thing. Short-haired guys looking really smart and into Gina Washington. It was about the fashion then, as much as it was about the music. Though Gino Washington, a surrogate Otis Redding for British people, who you heard in person there, must have made a big impression too. EMI put Kevin together with another soul luminary to record Gino. Producer Pete Wingfield. It seemed to be, you know, a pretty solid band and a kind of a rebellious vibe. Young soul rebels without a cause, you could say. I never quite found out what the cause was, but it didn't matter. I was really happy with it. I remember coming home and playing Respect or something by Aretha Franklin and then putting this on and thinking, oh, that's all right.
I did like the horniness of it. <laughs> the horns sure as hell were loud. I mean, the way it ended up, which I think was a bone of contention at the time, you know, you had to put the horns to the level that they would normally be and then basically double it. And that, that was the sound of the record. Yeah, well, we had to fight for it, Pete. <laughs> I know you didn't mind us doing that, did you? But no, we didn't want it too sweet or echoey, and we wanted it right up the front. <laughs> Gino came out in March 1980 and the band were on their way to their first number one. First week or so when it's got up the charts, I remember like walking down the road in Bearwood and there's a load of girls come out from a dress shop where they were all working, they're all screaming and stuff. I thought, wow, this is fantastic. Yeah, I was in Los Angeles. I started getting telephone calls telling me about this group called Dexter's Midnight Runners writing a song about me called Gino. I could hardly believe it. Uh, I was laughing, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know what I mean? So... <laughs> I watched Top of the Pops every week. I never missed it. And when it did finally come, it was a bit overwhelming, really, for somebody like me who was from a little village. But then I felt the pressure coming on, really. I just felt, I don't feel like a bloody star, I feel horrible, and it just feels like a pressure, and it's, what's going on? And when I got there, Number one, I looked around and there was nothing. It was shallow. Pressure and dissatisfaction dogged Kevin throughout his career, as you're going to hear. But before we go on, we should stop for a marvel at Kevin's singing style, which I used to impersonate so accurately. Did you know? Was that me or was it Kevin? When I was the MC at the Comic Strip Club in the 1980s, I invented a musical number called Pop-Up Toasters, and we performed it as a pastiche of Dexy's Midnight Runners, amusingly called Alexi's Midnight Runners. Now, where the hell did that style come from? You gave me your escort, I gave you my time. Well, what I was really thinking to start with was I must have a vocal style. I need to have a vocal style. I don't know whether it's because Bernard Rhodes has said it, but he did say it. You know, he said, look, all the great singers have got vocal style. Look at Elvis Presley, look at Frank Sinatra. I said, well, those are their natural voices, aren't they, Elvis and Frank Sinatra? And he said, no, they've decided to sing like that. And a few weeks later, I um, phoned him up. I said, what about if I put a cry in my voice? And I think he misunderstood me. He went, oh, well, Johnny Ray used to cry on stage. And I'm like, no, I don't mean that. I mean like a cry in the voice, like a... I don't know where I, I got it from. It might have come from General Johnson, chairman of the board. I did like him, with that kind of yelp in the voice. You know, the lyrics were very important to him, and it was all like a bit this big statement and all that. So, you know, he'd have the lyrics, and then he'd, to my mind, <laughs> sing it so sort of stylized as to make the words virtually unintelligible, you know. So I remember saying, you know, listen, um, if the words are so important, people should hear what they are. He said, uh, yeah, well, they will have the sleeve note with the record. To which, obviously, my response was, well, you can't hear a sleeve note on the radio. Nah, nah, I couldn't understand either. <laughs> nah, nah, I've never sit down and went over the words. No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> There, There, My Dear, which became the next single, was recorded in a creative atmosphere, with Dexys fighting off Pete's advances. Yeah, it's quite funny, that, in the studio, you know, because um, Pete Wingfield, he was always trying to put soul inflections, you know, real traditional soul inflections into our music, but we didn't want that because we knew that would... It would take away our edge kind of thing. I remember him, like, we got the lyric, I'm a keep quoting Kevin Burling, Burroughs, Michael Raymond... wanted to put in the backing vocal, Caraway, ooh, something like that. I remember thinking that. <laughs> but he was great, you know, when he was coming up with stuff. He was such an enthusiast. The album Searching for the Young Soul Rebels was finished. One of the best first albums ever. I remember thinking, to be honest, that it was perfection at the time. And that's all you can ask for. 
the contrast between Section 3 Young's Rebels and what was around at the time was so marked. If there was one record, I could only ever have one record, it would be that record. Uh, in fact, it would be all of Dex's records, I'd take all of them. But if it was had to be one, I think it would have to be that one. But the album almost never reached fans like Craig Reed of The Proclaimers, because this is when the notorious great tape robbery occurred. It's sort of, I guess, assumed the status of a sort of music biz myth. The only difference being that unlike some of those myths, it's all true. <laughs> it was just right at the very, very last minute. We'd finished the project, everybody, yeah, great, you know. As I recall, we were sort of running off copies, I think, from the multi-track to a two-track. And uh, on some kind of given signal, they sort of moved as one, as a sort of um, military unit, and <laughs> physically snatched the, the reels of tape from the machines and um, rushed down into the uh, car park, uh, sort of, um, you know, nudging away anybody that was in their way. And uh, the roadie had the motor, gunning the motor already, and they sort of sped out into the night. <laughs> The idea, I believe, was to sort of hold the record company to ransom for a better deal. Just being stupid, really. Just looking for a fight, really. I didn't give a monkey's about the royalty rate. I think I really just liked the idea of nicking the tapes, to be honest. I think our probably career was over after that, really. You know, they wanted the album out. We just had a number one single. I mean, you know, all we had to do was release the album. And everything would have been fine, but there always seemed to be a lot of dramas where I was involved. <laughs> Let's make the record company an enemy. Let's make the press an enemy. Oh, they hated him. They absolutely despised him. The amount of grief I used to get for supporting Dexys. But they did what all great groups do, which is they divide people. You're either for or against. There was no in-between. You never found any person who would just say, yeah, quite like Dexys. They either absolutely despised them or would give up their life for them. Whether you were for or against Dexys was a big deal in 1980. They were at the top of the ladder. Briefly. They went on tour to capitalise on this fame, but it wasn't what Kevin had hoped for. What was booked was a seven-week sort of tour of Locarno's around England in the summer of 1980, and the, the management wouldn't let you go on till quite late, you know, 11, 12, and they'd probably have a couple of support bands on before that, so everybody would be really lagged. 2,000 people a night, most of them didn't know anything about us except Gino. It was just Gino, Gino, Gino they all seemed to want, and I was really quite troubled, actually. There, there, my dear, was the follow-up to Gino. It got into the top ten, but it had nothing like the success of Gino. Things were getting tense in the band as well, mostly because of Kevin's tyranny, which was made worse by his insecurity and his unhappiness. They recorded another single, a rewritten and re-recorded version of Keep It from the album, which he subtitled Inferiority Part One. It was a statement of desperation, and it didn't even make the top 75. I've done better than that. wasn't talking to the group, we weren't speaking, and I just wrote that. That was kind of what I... I was just into myself, really, and wrote that lyric. I thought it was going to be a monster, because people were going on about the emotion of Dexys. I thought, well, check this out. You want some real truth and emotion? Try this. But I think I oversang it, I don't know. Now all I know lyric books That you're the worst of my looks No time to buy the time to rewrite mine I'd show it to you If nothing better to do But there's no point It doesn't look like you If you can teach your dog tricks I think I'll see the thing I remember at the time that he said, you know, flaunt your insecurities. What I think to say, it was the ability to stand up, be truthful about what you truly felt, not what you think you should feel, not what um, the, the current culture conditions you to feel that you should feel, what you actually do feel about a situation. And it's all right to not know. Right? It's all right to not be certain. It's all right to be confused. It's all right to be pissed off about something that other people tell you you shouldn't be pissed off about because that's what you feel. These words aren't lyrics. These words aren't lyrics. They're just words from the heart that redefine nervous. 
If mental pain's not the aim, why does it claim me? Stay We toured uh, England and it was all getting a bit much. We went over and played a couple of shows in New York. Then we went to, then we did a European tour and it was just getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And the band broke up in Zurich. Did Kevin Archie come and tell me? I think he did. He said, um, Kev, look, it was the last day of the thing and he said, look, you got me for a cup of tea. He said, they want to carry on without you. And uh, I remember actually thinking, uh, what a relief, you know. I was so relieved it was over the tension and all the pressure that was in my mind and all of a sudden the band were no more and um, I actually started crying on stage and to be honest that was one of the best gigs we ever did it was a short era but it was a great era two years the best years of my life what the hell that you was with but can you wait for him you who's only but two the band have split up well the programme's over then We'll fill the next half an hour on Radio 2 with me going... <laughs> no, of course we won't. Meet the new Dexies! Jim was in. That was a sort of Dexies Mark II, really. Uh, I mean, a completely new band apart from Kevin and myself. One of the new members was Kevin Adams. At the beginning, when Kevin Rowland had formed the band with Kevin Archer, Rowland had insisted on Archer changing his name to Al. The same happened now with Kevin Adams. This band still wasn't big enough for two Kevins. When I first joined the band, uh, Kevin said to me that it would make things easier if there weren't two Kevins in the band, but what did I think about possibly changing my name? When Billy was suggested, the rest of the band really liked it. Typically, the first thing Kevin came up with for Dexy's Mark II was a look. I'd already had the idea for ponytails and stuff, and I think I went up to Liverpool just after we'd broken up, and I saw these scallies wandering around with wedge haircuts and anoraks, and I thought, oh, anoraks look good. And I'd always liked boxing boots. This was my favourite Dexy's look, kind of mix of sportswear and a very kind of austere look about it as well, quite monastic. And they were talking about... Um, Self-development was the key thing and how they were training. And Now it was more serious, it was more labour-intensive in a way, and we just worked for hours and hours and hours on songs, you know, all day, every day. It was also right for us. It was a spiritual edge to the music and running, and it went with that. Yes, running. This time, Kevin added a fitness regime to the Dexys rule book. We all rehearsed hard, but there are a few of us that worked out too, and, you know, we lived and breathed it, and we'd go out running every other night. We didn't have the bars opening and, and serving alcohol at the shows we played on the projected Passion Reviews, so the audience didn't actually have a lot of choice. They couldn't drink once they came through the doors. I won't need to think of nice things to say. Towards the end of that year, by no, the end of 81, we had a fanatical audience. We had a new audience in a way that those projected Passion Review shows were something else, really. I went to one of them, well, I went to all of them, <laughs> and um, they was, he was doing Soon. It was kind of this great contradiction where he's singing, and the line goes something like, no need for violence. No need for pain, nothing physical, no violence. Just and then he turned away from the microphone and he goes to this guy in the front row, if you don't shut up, I'm going to come down there and kick your head in. No need for violence. <laughs> Dexys developed a new kind of religious soul music. Billy was a committed disciple. It was my opportunity to be part of something. I did absolutely live and breathe it. And until I believe in my soul does represent that year to me. I was quite big, you could hear a pin drop. You know, we had the audience in the palm of our hand. I used to bounce down on my knees, you know that, yes, yes. I yes. bounce down on my knees and up. Yes. I'd seen James Brown do it. Yes. It was this whole idea about mixing the physical with the spiritual, which culminates in that song, Until I Believe in My Soul, where he talks about this is the fight between the body and the spirit. Yes. Punish the body to believe in the soul. And it's there. Well! <laughs> Yeah. 
I'll punish the body till I believe in the soul. I don't even know where it came, you know, I don't know. And it meant something to me. It meant something, what that song personifies is the attitude we had in Dexys, work hard and the spiritual thing starts to happen. Soul music, salvation, and that's what kind of brought in a lot of people. This is Radio 2 from the BBC. I'm Alexis Sale with the story of Kevin Rowland and Dexys Midnight Runners. Adamant was really popular and we had this kind of very serious following, which was a nice thing, but I started to get tired of it, really, and I started to sort of yearn for some pop success. And I remember, like, putting on a gypsy bandana thing around my head and saying to the people, what do you think? After this hooded look came the dungarees and leather jerkins, you know, gypsy look, as it were. If you can imagine the early 80s, when uh, there were a lot of new romantic bands out and people were dressing up, it was great to come out and dress in down, you know. I do think there were quite a few people within the band that weren't quite so impressed. I remember when we first got the dungarees out and showed them to some of the band members. I seem to remember them thinking it was a bit Billy Smart Circus. <laughs> I wasn't too keen on the pinafore dress, but um, I did think it was a great image. That was Helen Bevington, as she was called when she joined Dexys at the beginning of 1982. And, as you'd imagine, with the new look, there was a new sound. Helen was a student of the violin, and Kevin was becoming interested in using strings. Though it's subsequently been suggested that this idea came from ex-Dexys member Kevin Stroke Al Archer. Kevin Archer brought a demo tape round to my house in about October, November 81, and he played me his demos, which I thought were very good. I was more influenced by the sound of that tape than I should have been. And that's it, really. Apart from one of his songs, he had a breakdown and a speed-up section. It was a completely different rhythm and melody to Come On Eileen, but I used the idea, and it was wrong, I shouldn't have done it. But I didn't nick his melody, his rhythm, his words or any of Kevin Archer's music. Kevin came up with the idea of three violins, and so I found two other violinists, and we recorded the Celtic Soul Brothers. Celtic Soul Brothers was me and Jim. Jim being Scottish, me being Irish. Strong devoted, supposedly. It was the band, anyway. Well, that was my ideal. It was the new production, you know, we'd got Langley and Stanley and they'd produced that as a one-off single. And it had gone well. But it didn't reach the top 40. Excuse me, please. I remember somebody in the group saying, well, if you know, there isn't another hit single, then the band is probably going to have to close. Kevin again was getting inspiration from Ireland and he created a new national identity for the band. We had three violinists join the band and Kevin thought of calling them the Emerald Express, as if they were an Irish trio. That, that wasn't true at all, none of them were Irish. Helen Bevington from Bristol was restyled Helen O'Hara, the Ballymena Bell. I didn't know anything about Ireland, really, or, and I'd say all the wrong things, and, but um, you sort of did as you were told, really, in Dexys. <laughs> so um, I did. <laughs> but could strings and brass live together in Dexys' Midnight Runners? Kevin found out when he was working on the tune for Come On Eileen. I remember right as we were writing it, you know, the, it was getting to that bit. And I remember, like, we struggled with that song. I was showing this to the band for the first time, really. That Come On Eileen, to the right, come on. I, got, I was showing them the, showing them the verse, showed them the choruses. Brian Brummett, who was the alto sax player, I remember showing it to the band and that Come On Eileen, to the I didn't have the words, come on, but I went, but I was, can you sing the backing vocals, please? And I got them singing it. And um, Brian was sort of questioning it and looked troubled. And I said, well, what's wrong? He went, I don't like it. And I just went, you know, well, if you don't like it, why don't you 
F off or whatever. And Brian went, OK, I will then. And he walked out. And Jim walked out with him as a protest. That was it. Jim left that day. I mean, I was always leaving. Because the brass had been such a, a, an important part of the band and adding strings obviously changed the, the sound completely in, in a different direction. It's quite complicated by now, isn't it? But I guess you can call this band Dexy's Mark III, at least. Anyway, back to that tune that split the band up. The one that's been a soundtrack to a million knees up since. Where did Eileen come from? It had been inspired by, I was over in Sweden, and this girl came to interview me, and she was talking about the spirituality of Dexy's. But the fact of it was, she was absolutely beautiful, and I just really fancied her, you know. But I wasn't able to say that because we were having this conversation about spirituality. What I really wanted to do was, you know, get next to her. But it also reminded me of, like, um, the conflict of growing up a street Catholic and being with these second-generation Irish girls at the youth club when I was 13, 14, 15 and wanting to kind of get sexual with them, but thinking it was bad because they were nice Catholic girls somehow, you know. <laughs> One Eileen was the biggest selling single in the UK in 1982, and Tu Rai the album, was doing good business as well. In 1983, they reached an even more unlikely height. Eileen got to number one in the United States. You know, I didn't feel any sense of achievement because I, I think I really did want a career in America, actually, and I was desperately disappointed because I knew by that time that we weren't taken seriously. We were seen as a novelty act. They thought we were Dickensian or something. I think we're, we're the ultimate one-hit wonder band over there. I think it was even mentioned in an episode of The Simpsons. You know, the words you didn't capitalise on it were used, you know, a year or two later. Again, we had the problem of having a great big audience. We started touring Europe and all that, and we had lots of session players in the band because Jim was gone. I used to turn around sometimes and see some of the session players, and I think they thought... It was a bit of a sort of hillbilly pantomime. We wanted them to give 110% like we did ourselves. And that is what gave Kevin the reputation for being difficult. I don't know, it's terrible. They always seem to be yearning for the other man's grasp for whatever I didn't have. Another Gino, only bigger. It just seemed very light, in a very lightweight way. I always thought to myself, that level of success didn't suit them. It certainly didn't suit Kevin. He felt massively under pressure again, and like he'd lost control. I allowed myself to be talked into having Jackie Wilson said, release as the next single. We capitalised on coming on in having been a number one. We got to number five, and it went straight back out of the charts again. If 
Van Morrison did a great version of that song, and we did a similar one. We went on Top of the Pops to play Jackie Wilson Says. And you know the way a band human develops? You have sort of in-joke names for the songs. And we used to call Jackie Wilson Says Jockey Wilson. And somebody said, what if we go and ask someone at Top of the Pops if they've got a picture of Jockey Wilson? Wouldn't it be funny if there was a big picture of him behind us as we played the song? But because we were perceived as being a band without any sense of humour whatsoever, people didn't get the joke, and they thought it was a mistake by the BBC. I think one of the things that kept me going was clothes, and I think about... January, February 83, the first time we'd gone over to America, really. Walking down Madison Avenue, I saw a shop called Brooks Brothers, and they sold all these Ivy League clothes, which I'd worn as a teenager. And I went in that shop, and I started buying those shoes and that, and that was, like, great. And then I thought, wow, this is the next look. Really clean cut. And I'd come back with a suitcase full of Brooks Brothers clothes. And when Kevin has a new look, a new musical direction is never far behind. Dexies were about to embark on their biggest and most difficult project yet their greatest achievement and their greatest failure, the third album, Don't Stand Me Down. I thought, OK, go back to Birmingham, write some songs, do another album. I didn't know it would be, like, best part of two and a half years before the album would be released. I remember going to a record shop in Birmingham, and I didn't really think too much of it, but the bloke behind the counter recognised my face and he saw the albums I was buying. And I think I bought Blonde on Blonde, Highway 61 Revisited, two Dylan albums, and the Beach Boys' greatest hits. And he went, oh, that's interesting. Like, that's going to come out in your music. And I was like, get out for you. At the time, the talk was of, let's do something different. We didn't have a set band, so we decided to write the songs first and let the songs dictate the instrumentation. We decided we would go for a real feel. It was an intense process. It took a while for us to find the right musicians. But we did find some. We got Vincent Crane. Fantastic pianist, and added, you know, his personality to it. We worked with a lot of drummers, but we didn't really get what we wanted until we got Tim Dancy, who was Al Green's drummer. We'd already well into our budget by then, over our budget, and we said, sod it, let's get in. We were going for not only technical quality, but atmosphere, and technical quality, and great playing. I remember Vincent Crane going to me when we were starting to record in Montreux. He went, Kevin, this has got to be right, hasn't it? And I said, oh, yeah. He said, because if this is done right, it could be another dark side of the moon, couldn't it? Kevin had always used bits of speech in Dexy's music. But on Don't Stand Me Down, he took this to extremes. Songs on the album were punctuated by Kevin and Billy in conversation. I got the idea when I heard um, Van Morrison rave on John Dunn. We'd know roughly what we were going to say, but we'd leave it till the moment to see how it came out. All right, Bill. All right. All right. Come in. Where you been? Oh, around and about, you know. Yeah. You know, a special. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, what, you've been down in Bearwood? Yeah, that's yeah. right. I looked in down there. Uh, yeah. What, the little nibble? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's so funny because he talks yeah, about the little nibble, there? which I think is a motorway calf. Where you been on the little nibble? Yeah, yeah. Anyone down yeah, there? You know, any mutual acquaintances like they're all hanging out on this motorway calf? What were we all talking about when I came in? What, you mean just now? Yeah, just as I walked in. Well, just, you know, just different things, really, you know. Um, it was just so removed yeah. from yeah. everything yeah. that had gone before in terms of sound, yeah. in terms of song structure... And also in terms of what he was writing about, here he was talking about C&D, Ireland, falling in love. It was probably his most personal record to date, lyrically. Some of these personal lyrics were inspired by the love affair which had developed at the heart of Dexys, which must have been strange for the object of the songs. Me and Helen had got together. I think it all came out in the music, really. 
I'd feel fairly self-conscious initially, but after a while, you forget anything is perhaps directed towards you. I was thinking of the compromise when I saw the beauty in your eyes and hiding something in me, so I say so. You were always near to me. The thoughts of you will stay with me. Ooh, until the day I die. Listen to this has got such a raw power and such a great energy about it. It was recorded live and I think you can hear that on the album. I did think I'm putting everything I've got into this album, everything I know, everything I've got, and also it's going to be played great. I remember that has same feeling with certain of the Young Soul Rebels. Ah, great. Done it. I think I was so exhausted, you know, from the whole experience, and I knew that I could never go through that again, that experience. And Billy said, I don't want to do this again, Kev. But we, we held it together, and we managed to just never give up, even though, you know, Alan Wynn Stanley drifted off here to go off and do something else. Musicians came and went. The record company's patients came and went. But we did hold it together, thank God. Kevin, Helen and Billy finished their masterpiece in 1985. Their expectations were high, but the world wasn't ready. I think as soon as we'd, we'd started playing some of the demos to um, our manager and, and the record company, I mean, they couldn't make out a tale of it. And I think that was the beginning of the sort of shock, really, of what <laughs> Dexes were about to reveal. It was incredibly depressing when it was just put out with very little support and hardly any money spent, which is ludicrous when it had cost so much to produce. It was dreadful. It went in at 22 and then just dropped straight out the charts. They were meant to preview it on the tube and then I think on the Wednesday there was an electrician strike or a TV strike and the tube was pulled. So that failed. If you look at that album cover, it, it's a non-album cover. You look at it and you think, well, these are very four, very straight, conservative people. But you play that record and it's one of the most radical records made in the 80s. The record company and the music press and the media all contributed to the failure of the album. But semi-conscious self-sabotage was also a big factor. Got into this thing of not releasing a single, which is all stupid, you know. And Radio 1 didn't play album tracks and they weren't going to change their policy for us, so that was a fairly catastrophic decision, I guess. We probably should have released This Is What She's Like as a 12-inch single. The record company even said that to me, give us something, let me release a 12-inch single. It could have been maybe a bloody Bohemian Rhapsody for the 80s, you know. I saw him at the Dominion Theatre and it was pitiful, man. It was about a quarter full. I remember seeing Dexys when he played Edinburgh with that record and there was something very poignant about seeing him in that theatre a couple of years after it had such success and seeing them there when there wasn't as many people there. The failure of Don't Stand Me Down really, really hurt Kevin. Even though he'd been doing all his best to sabotage his success, the fact that when he was successful in doing so, I think really knocked him. People weren't coming up to me going, great album, no one liked it, but great album. But they were going up to me saying, self-indulgent. You went up your own ass there, didn't you? People were saying things like that to me. There was one last hit, the theme music from a BBC sitcom. It's not many people's favourite Dexys record. We were approached to write a song for Brushstrokes and Kevin and Helen worked it into Because of You. I've got to be honest, I've never been a huge fan of that song. I thought it was all right, that record. I don't think there's anything wrong with that record. Because of you, these things I do. It broke up. I mean, I say it broke up. I think we were broke. I didn't so much end as fizzle out, really, did we, I think? Kevin wanted to move to London. I said, Bill, you know what, I think this is a solo album, and he was like, yeah, he's sort of quite relieved when I said it. 
there was nothing sort of definite about so I'm leaving or anything like that. You know, we just found our natural paths really and, and went on them. The Wanderer was released in 1988. It was credited to Kevin Rowland of Dexy's Midnight Runners. He didn't make a very good record because he was floundering a bit. The album came out and again, he did nothing. What's worth pointing out is someone pointed it out to me is I always seem to react against what I've just done. So I just went and wrote a load of simple songs, almost country and western. It wasn't Don't Stand Me Down, that's for sure. And then I had a lost weekend that lasted about five, six years, <laughs> which I came out of in about 93. The acid house thing was starting to happen around that point as well. He just went from one extreme to another. He went from this kind of guy with the, um, the Brooks Brothers suit and the very kind of puritanical outlook to, you know, the guy with the stripy T-shirt and the uh, sombrero. And, um, and I used to see him in clubs all the time. Lost weekend, I can put that in one sentence. Lost weekend, five years, got help. OK now. <laughs> Kevin had sunk into the deepest pits of drug dependency and destitution, and he'd pulled himself out. Late in the 90s, he got a deal with Creation Records. Things seemed to be on the up. He conceived and recorded an album of covers, but it was the cover of the album that led to Kevin's biggest debacle yet. I knew that I didn't need to write my own songs to do a good album. I knew, I knew I could tell my story through other people's songs. It's over, it's over, it's no over. More, it's no over. more, no more, it's OK. Yes, I know. Oh, you know, you know. The first I knew about it you know, was Mom. I'd just bought ID magazine and he was in the back of that. He actually looked quite good in that, I think. He had a sort of smedley top then with a skirt and trainers. I was in a Thai restaurant and I saw a guy at a sarong and I thought, that looks good. This is like 95 and I got a sarong summer of 95. It was about three years before they came, fashionable. And I wore it, and then I developed it more. And I thought, oh, you know what, I'm going to paint my fingernails. And I just developed it all. I saw the posters, and of course, within, I don't know, half an hour, there was graffiti on those posters. The guy had written bloody pufta or something on it. I was again shocked by the savagery, actually, of the, some of the stuff that had come out. It was too radical for people. And also the fact that he had his skirt pulled up to Vril's underwear, really kind of, I don't know, it just sent people, didn't it? To be honest, it's not everybody's cup of tea, you know. But then again, I don't necessarily get my fashion tips from Q magazine, you know, who were absolutely reviled. He's been saying basically, well, you say that this arena we're all in, this music arena is open to everybody and it's a really liberal thing. But every time he walks into that arena with a different look, he gets laughed at. How reactionary is the music press? He was crucified for it. I'm still proud of it, you know. The look and the music. That album, My Beauty, I, I still play now. Instead of sort of strength through anger, it's strength through love, because he'd been through his addictions and he'd lost everything and he'd been no living in squads and he'd had a really tough time. In that album, he's kind of come through the other side and now he's kind of trying to reach out to other people who are having a tough time. The greatest love of all, I think, maybe one of these greatest ever vocals. I decided long ago I didn't want to walk in anyone's shadow If I fail, if I succeed I like to live as I believe No matter what they say about me They can't take my personal dignity Because the greatest love of all Is happening to me Battered and bleeding Kevin withdrew from the public arena again. Until the end of last year, when fans were amazed to learn of a tour and a best of CD featuring two newly recorded songs. Spirits were high amongst the audiences and the largely new lineup. It was the first opportunity to see Dexys perform in 17 years. And they pulled it off. I loved it. I loved it. It just all worked for us. We made it relevant to now, because I started to remember the feeling, oh, yeah. I used to really enjoy that feeling, didn't I, of working with the band and maybe giving some direction and it really clicking in some kind of spiritual way. On that upbeat note, we've reached an end to tonight's story of Kevin Rowland and Dexy's Midnight Runners, one of the most loved and most hated acts. 
one of the most pretentious and yet one of the most sublime that British pop has ever thrown up. Today, Kevin doesn't have a record deal and the future's looking uncertain, but he seems to have reached a serenity and a perspective that's often eluded him in the past. I'd like to make an album and then do more shows. I'd like to be taken seriously. Kevin Owens is the only person I have ever met in music where I would see without one hesitation he is totally an artist yeah. and that most people involved in music, they might be really good, they might be really talented, but they're not actually artists. I've started to look upon Dexys quite negatively for a long time and my input in it negatively, but it paid off. Maybe I wasn't all bad in a funny sort of way. You were listening to Kevin Rowland, voice, Jim Patterson, trombone, Kevin, a.k.a. Billy Adams, guitar, Helen Stooks, a.k.a. Helen O'Hara, on fiddle, Greg and Charlie Reed of The Proclaimers, Pete Wingfield, Soul Inflections, Gino Washington, Laughs, and Paolo Hewitt, Lies. <laughs> Alexion Dexys is a BBC Scotland production for Radio 2 by Richard Bull. My